Hey folks, uh, welcome to Snowpal Software Development and Architecture Podcast. Our guest today is Tracy Reagan, who's a CEO and co-founder of Deploy Hub. She's an expert in software supply chain management and pipeline DevOps practices with a hyper focus on microservices and cloud native architecture. Tracy has served on the governing boards of the OpenSSF, Continuously, Continuous Delivery Foundation and Eclipse Foundation. Uh, Tracy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I enjoy this. Thank you so much for taking time because, you know, this is a topic that is it's very interesting and, and also I'm one that I'm not particularly familiar with. And while I do a number of these podcasts, uh, what also gets me truly excited is talking about items that I have uh, very little <laughs> knowledge about. So this is one of those topics. So I think I'm going to actually have plenty of learning uh, during the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so before we get started, uh, the topic for today is, is around supply chain management. So for folks who are watching this or listening to the podcast, Tracy, if you could just give a high level introduction of, uh, you know, we'll get into some of the details. Like I have a list of questions just to, you know, uh, get our conversation forward. But if you could give a high level introduction to folks who are in the space of engineering, but don't exactly understand what supply, software supply chain management is. That's a really good question. And I would, you know, personally, I would like to not use that term software supply chain management because it's really configuration management. And it's about, you know, the focus now is on the um, amount of open source packages that we consume as part of our software development practice that we may not know we're consuming. Uh, you know, okay. software supply chain is just a, it's just a new, one of those new shiny objects that, what, that is designed to get your attention. But in reality, it's, it's the same thing as we've always been done when we're, we're building software and that's incorporating and consuming libraries. And now we want to track them because there's such a broad dependency tree and they're in, it becomes very complex, uh, when we're starting to consume open source. Okay, that makes complete sense. So let me, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper into that. So do we look at it like, let's, I'm going to take a few examples. I'm also going to take an example of, you know, we're going to talk about Deploy Hub, uh, the product that, uh, you know, uh, you own. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Snowpal and, you know, I can give you a quick introduction during the podcast about some of the things that we do and also take companies, much larger organizations as well that I've, uh, you know, I'm sure you work with and I've worked with as well. So in the context of, Configuration management, let's say uh, you mentioned uh, S bombs the other day, right? Like software bill of materials. So as an introduction, yes. would that be a good point to start this conversation, like talking about software bill of materials? I think it jumps ahead a bit, but we can certainly do that. And we can always come back around and understand because I think understanding architecture and how applications are built is an important, uh, important part of the puzzle. Um, S bombs have need context. We need something to associate an S bomb to. And when we talk about architecture, modern architecture, decoupled architecture, microservices architecture, we really have to stay, take a step back and understand what it is that we're building because software supply chain is it, the complexity around software supply chain. It, it expands in a microservices world compared to old, older traditional monolithic style development. So I think talking about that is critical because then SBOMs and the challenges around SBOMs and why we need them make more sense. Perfect. Let me take an example then. Uh, some of this might come across as manufactured, but I promise you they are not. It's just coming directly from experience of having done this. So you mentioned monolithic and microservices. It's, it's an interesting topic. I personally have done more than one podcast on that but let's focus on the aspect that you're mentioning here. If I took an organization that has a monolithic application, and you know, I'm, no, I'm sure a lot of us have worked with companies, uh, you know, that have a, a pretty big, large application that does like n number of things. And at some point, you they talk about okay, breaking this down into manageable pieces, and you talk about making creating more and more microservices. That that could be a traditional path for companies for legacy applications. Newer applications that are being built by uh, by companies, you start out probably the right way. In some cases, microservices is probably the right way to go. In other cases, perhaps monolith. But in, in, in the context of configuration management or software uh, supply chain or tracking libraries, Tracy, how do we approach 
these two situations uh, because I presume it's going to be quite different. If I have a monolithic application, let's say, let's take an example. And if I, for the exact same app, if I actually broke that down to like 10 different microservices, how does configuration management and the tracking of libraries have to be addressed and how differently should that be between uh, these two cases? And that is the puzzle, right? So just for the listeners, let's think about how we did it in Monolith. Uh, in a Monolith uh, uh, practice, we do a software build. And when I talk about builds, I'm meaning compiling and linking code into objects and those objects into a binary that, or a, a set of binaries. You know, I've seen builds that have a hundred binaries that they're releasing, you know, DLLs and a few executables, hundreds of DLLs. So we have been doing this for quite some time. We've been thinking about how to decouple for quite some time. All the way, go, we always go back to object-oriented programming. Somebody write one function so we can all use it instead of all of us writing the same function over and over and over, which is, can be costly and um, way, way redundant. Let's just put it that way. So right. in Monolith, we did a compile and we created a, CI, a continuous integration server to say, as soon as you update something, let's recompile it, make sure nobody broke the build. We used to struggle for doing 10 minute or less builds. And that was all about bringing in the, su the supply going into our software. And I called it configuration management back there. Um, and being on top of it. So in, in case you brought a library in that broke something, you would know sooner than later. And that was a whole idea around continuous integration and continuous build and the ability to automate these um, really uh, boring steps. And so somebody wasn't sitting there doing a deployment one server at a time. Now, while we still use continuous integration, it has changed in the way we approach li bu building these uh, decoupled architectures. So instead of having one monolithic build, we instead have lots of small builds. And every build builds a, a, a unique container that has our particular function. Now, what I see happening uh, in, the, in the microservices world is I see people going back to their old practices. So they may want to um, create one big giant Helm chart to, to, and that consumes all these different uh, microservices and the deployment of those microservices. So they're still managing a monolith, really. They're not thinking about this as a truly decoupled architecture. It's like in object-oriented programming, we say we should share common libraries, but what we would do is copy them and, and check them into our own repos. So they became ours. And right. I think software developers continue to have this issue where they have to, it's got to be theirs. But if we think about what we're trying to do in, in a microservices or decoupled architecture, we're really trying to spread the love, right? If somebody's written a really good login routine and it's been blessed by the security team, then all the other teams should be consuming it. And if there's a problem that we find in it, even though you might say, well, now everybody has the same problem. Yes, but everybody gets it fixed at the same time. Um, not every Absolutely. application team needs to be to write all of the login routines. They don't need to write, write all, all of the error routines. They don't need to write all the communication, all the database update, update routines. And microservice can break it down into you have one microservice that just goes out and gets a person's name and address, for example. So why does everybody have to write that same one? If you're working for a bank and everybody needs that information, this is a good way to do it. But that means you have to collaborate and you have to share as well as be accountable for the software that you're delivering, including the security in it. And this is where we get to SBOMs. So now everybody should be delivering an SBOM for every single small container, small function, little API. Everybody is accountable for delivering an SBOM so that it can uh, represent a, a larger application, which is our other challenge. How do you, in this new world, what is an application release? Do we have release versions in this new world? If I, am, if I am a application team and I write my functions that I need for my application, but I'm consuming all of these other containers that these, these, um, these other functional teams are, are providing for me, how do I know when my, app, my application's been updated? If, if a new version of the uh, database, one of the database routines to go access some data changes and my application breaks because of some reason, 
I may not know even that we had a new application version running out there. <laughs> it just happened, right? Because somebody updated it. And Absolutely. these are the new challenges that we have. And, and, the, and it really expands the complexity, but it's only complex because we don't have at yet, we don't have not sorted out how to centralize the data and share it and, and from a collaborative perspective. Okay, so those are fantastic points. Let me ask you a few questions there. So monolith versus microservices that we're talking about. Let's say I was, let's say I built an application for maybe a restaurant industry, just as a random example. And I have a monolith that basically does everything. You know, if it's a web application with dependencies on the server side, let's let's pretend that it's one repo. It's a mono repo. Not that it matters here, but it's one mono repo, and it's it's a single application and single deployment. I have a, a bill of materials, a software bill of materials. That, uh, in layman's terms, I presume it's going to have a list of every library uh, that's being used, its version numbers, compliance, and whatnot. If I took that same thing and I broke that down into microservices. Does that mean I would have, let's pretend that I'm in this example, let's say I break it down into like five microservices. Does it mean I would have five different bill of materials, which each of them having simply the libraries and the dependencies of that particular microservice? Bingo. Yes, you will. Because a, a, an SBOM is generated based on a build, what you're building. It doesn't know about anything else. It only knows about, it's only going to create an SBOM on the code that you're submitting the build for. So it's not going to do it on in the whole repo. It's only going to do, you know, you're only going to generate an SBOM on what the build is, is worried about. So if you're building a container and it has that particular uh, function or API in it, it's going to get an SBOM for that one. So this is why you're starting to hear in the industry, how do you share SBOMs? And I think the better question is, what is an application release? And how do we generate an SBOM for an application release, even in a decoupled architecture? Because every time a, a function team releases something and says, hey, it's out there, in essence, they need to now generate a new SBOM for every application that consumed their function. And that should, that's, that's a lot of toil. So right. the industry, we have, to, we have to be more collaborative. We have to start centralizing this information and tracking these broad dependency maps even in our own source code, even in the, in the, at the, I guess you would call it inner source, regardless of the open source that they may be consuming, we first have a challenge of understanding who the consumers are and who uh, the uh, producers are and creating those kind of dependency maps. I hate to use the term map, but that's what they are, or lists. And then from there, we can start digging down into what open source we're using and bring that information up too. And those should be aggregated SBOMs so that the software supply chain is reported for the entire application. Everything, every single time it gets updated, regardless if the team knows they got a new release. So uh, at least let me make sure I understand this. Um, so you said aggregated SBOMs. Does it mean in my example, if I had five microservices that was a, a rewrite of the monolith, would I have an aggregated SBOM that encompasses all these five microservices or would I actually have five distinct SBOMs? I think you should have one that one aggregated one that gives you all of the information and takes out the duplicates, which right? makes if a lot of sense. To, because yeah. sorry, go ahead. you got you got to make you got to simplify it for the reader. The S bombs kind of suck to be quite honest. They are they are gory details, and I mean, let, let's say if you uh, you know we go back to our log for J example, which is probably overused, but it's a really good example. We'd have to go through and interrogate all of the microservice S bombs to find out where Log4j was running. Now, I guess you could grep it, but you better know where they are, and you better know what version of those S bombs are associated to the release of the application you're running in your production environment. Otherwise, it's a waste of time because you could have an S bomb that got generated on something that never got released, and that version of Log4j was never consumed. But if even if it didn't, when you say never got released. You're talking about release to production, but if it is part of your mix of things in your lower environments, it probably is only a matter of time before it gets released or do we go into that level of detail? Hey, you know what? Perhaps I'm just exploring something new. I may or may not actually publish this service or the actual functionality or feature to production. So do I actually defer the, the modifications to these software bill of materials till it comes close enough to see the light of day? Or do I actually start engaging in the process of these S-bombs at the point from a dev team or an, as an architect, 
I go make a pick a selection of a library. You should generate a, a S bomb should get generated for every single build you do. Now, keep in mind that in a, if we go back to our continuous integration world, which we all should never throw away because it's important, uh, we need to do a build every time there's something checked in. But that does not mean it goes to production. It just might mean I'm going away. I'm I'm done for the evening. I'm going to check all my code in, and it's going to initiate a compile. And in fact, there should just be something your CI server should be set up to say, I have a wait time. I'm going to recompile this. I'm going to look to see if there, the repo has been updated. And if it has, I'm going to recompile it. And a new SBOM should be generated as part of that process, as well as any other security tools that you should be using, including maybe checking to see if the repo itself is being scanned for, for, for issues. Uh, so just because you build something doesn't mean that it's, it's gonna, it may get deployed to a dev site, but it doesn't go to production. And when we are worried about it, it when an issue shows up, a log4j happens, what we really want to know is where is it running in production Literally, what what clusters it running on? For example, what containers con are consuming it, and what applications are being impacted by it? Where is it? You know, there's vulnerabilities generated every day, hundreds of them. I mean, we're, we're all like going, to, getting dizzy trying to track vulnerabilities, but only some of them. It's not like they all are impacting our environments every day. Some of them might be out there, but they don't even touch. They, they literally cannot touch our. Uh, the instructions don't touch anything that we're running. So the data is, there's so much data and the volume is so huge and we have to continue to, to generate it. There's got to be a way for us to continually generate it all the time, all, that's, all of that, that, those gory details and know where it is in that environment. Is, you know, this release of this particular component was updated in the dev environment and it impacted five of my applications so if I update it in production, I'm going to impact five applications and I need to let them all know they have new SBOMs in their production environment if it gets pushed forward. So everybody's going to have a different, uh, a different process in terms of managing what goes, to, you know, what goes from dev to prod. And we know one thing, most teams are trying to do that fast. Right. They don't want things getting in the way. So... That is the question that you asked earlier, right? How do we manage all those libraries moving forward and still know where we are? We, we've lost our North Star in not knowing the application release because the application release in Monolithic told us everything, including one giant SBOM. But our new CI process, our new continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevSecOps, whatever, supply chain, configuration management, whatever we're calling it, right. What it has to have is the ability for us to know what is running in production. What is an application? Now it's logical. Who, what, are, what is this logical application consuming? These containers. What do these containers have in them? Let's look at the SBOM and let's start aggregating that kind of information so it makes it easier for us to manage and still go fast. We Correct. still because have to go fast. <laughs> yeah, no, because you know uh, earlier, like years ago, uh, you push changes to production Perhaps once every, you know, I used to work for much larger organizations where, you know, we released uh, changes like once every quarter, maybe, right? Then you maybe that became a little bit more frequent. You push changes to production. It was a different release team. It was like six or eight week turnaround time. But today we're talking multiple deployments, not just during the course of a week, but we're talking tens of deployments on any given day, which means uh, I'm just thinking about it from a development standpoint. You know, when you're fixing bugs or even make, perhaps making enhancements, perhaps uh, it's unlikely, uh, it's, it's not impossible, but it's in, uh, unlikely that there's going to be changes to these to S bombs possibly. But when you're adding new features, there's more of a chance. When you're certainly adding new microservices, it's going to have an impact. So how frequently your deployment is going to be, uh, you know, I, presume, I mean, is that fair to say, Tracy, that you know the frequency of deployments and how much you actually build as a company, whether you're you know your mid-sized, large company or a startup, where all of them will play a role into the complexity of this SBOM management. Um, that's an honest question. Uh, I just, you know, I feel like we're smart people. We can automate this stuff. And that's part of what Deploy Hub is doing. It aggregates and, and it continuously aggregates DevSecOps data up to the higher order. 
And we need to be able to get to a point where it's not even just looking at an SBOM from a logical application perspective, but give me an SBOM for my entire runtime environment. Let me, let me look at all the S, take all the SBOMs that are, that are running in my production environment and give me one big giant SBOM. Take out all the duplicates, but just show me every single open source package that's running. So if I want to do a search on Log4j, I can find it immediately. I should be able to do that at, at a, we'll just call it a domain level. Show me all of the SBOMs that, that are, show me all of the dependencies I have running in my, my mortgage domain, if I'm a bank, or my, my online um, uh, auto loan domain. We, we should be able to take the data that we're generating across the DevSecOps pipeline, consume it, aggregate it, and, and do something with it, make it actionable. And not only that, that is where our threat modeling is going to come from. If we, if we ever want to have you know, generated uh, pipelines that are improved or do anything in the, dev, the DevOps world with generative AI or machine learning, even just great ML workflows, we need data. Right. And most of our data lives in, in logs that are sitting underneath the, the DevOps pipeline, and we can't even see the trends. So trend analysis, how SBOMs are changing, that's going to be our new predictive layer. So it's important that we start, again, a collaboration effort, federating the data and, and start making it actionable. Whether it be SBOMs or whether it be the frequency of a deployment or digging down deeper and looking at a open source package that may only be managed by one person, like Log4j was, that's, that may be indicating it's a high risk package, right? right? And how do we bring that into our DevSecOps pipelines and say, at least flag it. You guys are using these packages. They don't have any security issues right now, but they may be found and there's only one person use, updating that package. So, so there's, the, there's so much information we just, we're not, we're not even thinking about because we don't. <laughs> Right. So Tracy, when you, these uh, S-bombs, are they, I presume they're not created manually, right? Nobody hand creates them. So is the, the tool, the, do tools typically go inspect your code, your repositories and generate these S-bombs? Yes. And there's different kinds of S-bombs. Um, but for the most part, S-bombs come in two formats, um, SPDX and a Cyclone format. Um, there are tools like SIFT that generate SBOMs in a Cyclone format. Um, there are tools that are now generating SBOMs for the container itself to see what's been brought into the container. And that can be done at the point in time the container uh, image is created. Uh, you know, I always uh, push back on c companies like Microsoft that have the compilers and they should be generating SBOMs at that point in time in one of those formats. But there's other kinds of SBOMs that are more system level SBOMs. Like I was saying, we need to be able to see everything in environment. We should be able to start building SBOMs uh, for operating systems because this has impact as well, especially when we're using open source. If we're using, if we're running Linux and Kubernetes, that SBOM information has an impact on the software that we're running on top of that. So there are different levels of uh, SBOM data that's needed to really build a full stack SBOM. And eventually, the deploy hub would like to be able to get to where we can build a full stack SBOM based on the generated SBOMs that are already being done in the Dev DevOps pipelines. We don't want to regenerate anything. We just want to consume it and aggregate it and give it back into a, a, a format that's usable and actionable. Right. Okay. So you mentioned a few different formats. I was gonna, I'm going to look them up later after our podcast, but, uh, but just for folks, again, watching or listening to this, uh, what what does it typically look? I mean, I mean, I'm just in my mind imagining uh, that a tool went and inspected the repository. Maybe it looked at the pub spec or gem files or you know package JSONs or however it does it, and it comes up with this you know a list of libraries and its dependencies. Does it represent that like in a in a JSON format? Like what is the typical format that it text. represents? Text. Okay. So <laughs> it's just text. So I'm saying it's just a big text report. And it's How not a I, pleasant thing to look at. Yes, yeah, so which means then my follow-up question would be, uh, which doesn't change. My question was still going to be there, which is if it's not, 
if it's text, it's not particularly machine readable or machine friendly. Does it, how do I, I mean, is, is, it, is the expectation that a human reads it or do we have tools that actually parse this text and make sense out of these S-bombs and dependencies and flag uh, potential vulnerabilities in, in some of the libraries that may have been part of the S-bomb? The assumption is that a human will read it. And this is one of the complaints that industry has with the Biden administration's um, SBOM order. I think it's 14028 is a uh, 14028, I think, is the number of the executive order that says, hey, you know what? If you're going to do business with the U.S. government, we need an SBOM. So great. That's a good step. Um, I wrote an article <laughs> with uh, Vincent Dannon from Red Hat, uh, and the title was um, S Bob, so good, so what, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, if you're not consuming the data, and if it's just being handed off to you in a text file, and you're not doing anything with the data, why do we do it? Right. There is got to be a way to consolidate and consume, consume and consolidate the information so that the amount of data that comes out of these S bombs have some context to it. And when you're working in a microservice environment, or let's just call it decoupled, you have lots of S-bombs to, to manage. And you have to manually track. I hear people that are saying, yeah, we track the S-bombs in a spreadsheet so that we can pull them all together when we want to do a release to the government, if they're doing government service. Mm -hmm. This is probably the, one of the biggest pain points that, that that executive order created if you're working in decoupled architecture, how do you create that, that aggregated SBOM and how do, you, how do you meet that mandate? And then they do all that work and it just sits there, right? The government's not really doing anything with it. So they're not trying to track all, they're not, they're not consuming all the SBOMs into one central evidence store and then looking at them and saying, we hear that there's a critical vulnerability here. Do we need to worry about it? Let's pass it off. Let's pass that information off to another tool that can tell us if we should be concerned about it. Because there's all kinds of different security tools on the market today. We have a, a, an amazing arsenal of security tools, but if they're not if they're not used, <laughs> if they're not if the data is not collected centrally, if we if we have trouble analyzing and monitoring no, and using the data. So, Trees, let me understand this. So, does it mean any automation that we're talking about, does it literally end at the point where these S-bombs are generated? And once they're generated and they're in this textual format, humans, literally people have to take those, whether they're spreadsheets or documents or whatnot, do they actually have to take that and do the analysis? Or is there a notion of some notion of automation after the creation of these S-bombs? I fear that the answer is uh, far easier. They check off a, bar, a tick box. They, they just, it's a check mark. So in case you ever need it, you can, you have it right now. It's just a check mark. It's not necessarily something we're actually using the data. Um, um, right. Okay. That is, th that is my complaint, right? About S bombs. It's not that they don't have good data. It's just that we're not using the data. We're not consuming the data. The data must be consumed so it can be actionable. It's critical for us, if we're going to require teams to start generating these S-bombs, we'd better be using them. We'd better be consuming them and we'd better do something with it. it Makes, even if yeah. it's a level of compliance or adding to our zero trust, uh, you know, what, so you know you're using these open source packages. An application team knows they're using these open source packages. How critical is that for production? Do they want to know it? Does the CISO office want to know it? What do we do with that information? And that's what we keep asking from in from Deploy Hub's perspective. How can we bring this information in and at least give the ability to do a single search on a single package and know where it's at? At minimum, we should be able to do that based on the S bombs, because then we can respond to vulnerabilities quickly. And at the end of the day, that is where we are when it comes to supply chain management. We have Makes to figure sense. out how to respond to vulnerabilities okay, quickly. Okay, so you know. 20 minutes, 20 some minutes in, at least I have some understanding and I'm sure the folks watching it understand bill of materials. So let me go to the next item here, which is a lot of us have been doing building software for a long time, yet we don't, you know, have, haven't had the opportunity or haven't run into the notion of S-bomb. So my, I have two questions, high level questions regarding that. One is, is this required typically the S-bombs, is this required 
clearly you mentioned government organizations but beyond government organizations are we talking like you know uh, these like big large banks and mortgage industries are those are there specific industries where as bombs are required and other industries where it's not or is it defined by the size of companies where the larger the organizations uh, the more likely that the requirements of as bombs are there like how do we place when what kind of software should one be building where they are more likely to run into uh, you know compliance and compliance issues that relate to as bombs so right now there is there really is no requirement to generate an S bomb unless you are working um, in the government or you're providing software to the government. That's it. There okay. is no other requirement for it. Now since um, the Log4J incident, which really impacted a lot of people, I, I call it a security awakening, and that's why I keep referencing it. It woke the, it woke us all up. It was sort of a slap in the face to have such a vulnerability running on so many um, servers where, you know, literally you could just exit out and, you know, it was log for shell. That was really the problem. And log for shell allows you to get out to the shell and execute commands. And we, that's not a good thing right. <laughs> ever, especially for a bank. <laughs> that's right. a bad, bad thing. <laughs> so while we've had the security awakening, we tend to get lost in all of the new information that's coming across, you know, it, our signatures uh, important is, uh, you know, is provenance something that we should be tracking? Uh, you know, S-bombs can provide us some of that information, but it doesn't necessarily do a lot of, of work on the, on the repo itself and what's being brought into the repo. So there's a lot of different aspects of security when it comes to software development and deployment. And so what happens is S-bombs, even though they become a conversation, it may not be what a bank sees as the most important thing to do right now. Maybe they're just trying to restrict open source from coming into their environment. Maybe they have decided to try to implement zero trust policies to only take certain open source. So it doesn't mean that SBOMs aren't important. I'm just saying that large organizations can easily get distracted in what's important. And in my yeah. world, I think that getting the SBOM information, because I am truly a software configuration management person, I've done that for all my life, understanding what we're consuming, what we're pulling into our binaries. That, I think, is probably the first place people that uh, organizations should start when securing their software supply chain. And SBOMs are an excellent way to do that because if it's free, you can bring that information in. But secondly, if you're not consuming it, maybe it's, it's, it's not worth it. I think that banks, that anything in the in, in fintech, um, anybody servicing a bank is probably going to be is going to be forced to provide S bombs, just like the government re requires it. Um, but I don't know how uh, useful S bombs are if we're not consuming it and doing something with the data. Makes sense. And then if I let's say even in the notion of uh, organizations that require something like an S bomb, is it only required? If it's actually uh, on the DMZ, in other words, if I have uh, uh, services that are deployed on, let's say, a VPC uh, where it is not available to the outside world, at least not directly so, uh, are there differences there or is it required agnostic to where it fits into the network topology? You know what? I don't know the answer to that question because, you know, I don't know how network engineers feel about that particular uh problem. I right. really don't. Um, I do know, though, that there is, we're, we're getting to a point where people are talking about, again, like I said, system level S-bombs so that we're driving all the way down and trying to see the full stack. Because there are different kinds of S-bombs. Uh, we, we configure things all the way through the life cycle. You know, we can we configure software, we configure networks, we configure uh, production environments. For example, I love to use this example, Nginx had an issue um, that was a denial of service issue. And it came out as a zero day vulnerability or a zero day issue. Um, and their fix was to update your configuration settings. Okay. okay, so that tells us that the configuration settings are as vulnerable or essential to manage and understand as your source code. Right, because this right. wasn't a source code issue. This was a denial of service based on a configuration setting. 
we need to keep track of all the configurations of things as well. So everything that we're configuring along the right way, we always do it in scripts, scripted here, scripted there, scripted there. In every, everybody's got their own scripts. We check them in and we feel like GitHub solved the problem because we've checked them in, but we don't know what it looks like. It's just checked in. So we have to go pull out those scripts and see what those configurations are while our website is down and we we're getting a denial of service uh, attack. Right. So there are different levels of understanding and transparency that is needed across the life cycle and S bombs, while they're a really good start, they don't solve all of them. And I really don't think that we've actually started a really addressing tracking configurations across the life cycle in the way that is useful. Now, again, we're getting sidetracked, I think. And, you know, I, I'm not a security specialist. I'm a security implementer. I'm the DevOps person. And if you've got tools that make the DevOps pipeline better, I want to implement them and I want to bring the data up into the boy hub so I can do something with it. But there are other things that are important too, like data security, uh, pen testing. So it's not the only thing we have to worry about. It just happens to be what I like to talk about. No, no, absolutely. And, then and AI is a whole different thing. We now are seeing problems with large language models and having to protect large language models. So we've, we have a lot of catching up to do as an industry. And I think every specialty needs to focus on what they can do best. And when it comes to DevOps and decoupled architectures, what they can do best is help teams aggregate that information through the DevOps pipeline. So at least we have that, but we can't right. solve DevOps pipeline that may not necessarily uh, uh, resolve, you know, data security and securing large language models and uh, pen testing and all the other kinds of, of network issues that you can have from a security perspective. But we can tell you if you've got a vulnerability and that is important. Makes sense. And you, you mentioned open source more than once. So my question is, is this is is it meant to are as bombs primarily or exclusively meant to only track open source software or do commercial like cots off the shelf solutions that we purchase the sold by other companies do those also make it into the as bombs they would make it in if it's a library you're consuming they wouldn't make it in if it's something that you're passing data to if it's an it depends on where the integration becomes and if it's con it concluded in your compile if it's included in your image, if you're creating your image. So let's say your image does bring COTS into it, then it's going to be, at the, your, it, you're going to be, at, you're going to know that in that image, that COTS software is there, but it's not going to go and be able to, because that's now in binary format. Right. So you're not going to be able to figure out the SBOM for that COTS software, unless you're requiring it and somehow they're, at they're attaching it, but that's probably not, I don't know if anybody's done that yet. Let's hope they do. But that's when we get to, the culture in general changing to as we as consumers of caught software to say, if you're going to give me your software, I also need the S bomb because now that is running in my production environment. And I need to know what's open source software you're including in it, because this is where the biggest vulnerability appears to be at this point. It's in the open source packages. Hmm, okay, makes sense. And you know, uh, while I was preparing for it a little bit, I just looked up uh, another site, I think uh, probably went from your homepage, Deploy Hub to Artelius. And I think I read a piece of text there that said, you know, generating security insights like AS bombs is, is not enough. And I think you mentioned that as well to harden uh, your software supply chain. It says consumption and analysis of the data is needed to rapidly respond to these supply chain threats. So, what does that mean? Like, let's say I have these S bombs and it doesn't look like my job is done. It's, it looks at best like it's a starting point. What as an organization do we do uh, after we have these S bombs presented, whether it's monolith or a microservice doesn't matter. If S bombs are inadequate, what are some of the other things that we might have to do? Chris, that is a really, really good point. We are, let's say, so let's just say we're generating S bombs for everything that we do. And let's say that we have a vulnerability. Now, remember, vulnerabilities change every day. You could have a completely, you could have an A score on your software today. And by five o'clock, you could have an F. That's how quickly <laughs> vulnerabilities change. Wow. S-bombs give us the ability to see how, so we have a vulnerability. So what, right? 
what we have to be able to do is quickly associate the vulnerability to any place that's consuming it. And that's what the SBOM information gives us. So okay. it's really not about SBOMs. It's really about being able to respond to vulnerabilities. And you know, I, I, I often relate this when I talk about this particular topic. Um, I believe that some of the work that's been done around chaos engineering, and this was something that, was, that came out of the SRE field, the ability to have game days and figure out how, not why something broke. It's not important to know why something broke on the very first day. What's important is you can you have a team that knows how to restore a, a, a system at three o'clock in the morning when they're half asleep. Right. And chaos engineering tells us to focus on, on restoring and then worrying about root cause analysis later. So in the security, if you think, if you apply that principle in the security, in the software supply chain, security realm with open source, it's not so important that we know that there is a vulnerability. What's important is we know how to respond and rapid response and thinking about teams as firefighters rushing in and being able to have the data that they need to, to, to rapidly respond to vulnerabilities is going to be, in my, in my thinking, more important than trying to prevent open source from ever coming in or trying to spend time in defining what you can trust and what you can't trust. Now, while that's important, you're, it's not, you're not gonna code scan your way out of the problem. You're not gonna test your way out of the problem. And that is kind of the philosophy around chaos engineering is let's get good at responding. And the only way we can do rapid response is with the knowledge of where this stuff is running. And that is how we get back to the conversation around, you got to have your S-bombs so you can say, these vulnerabilities, I know there's a vulnerability. And if I wrote the function that, I, that is a, in a microservice, I know I have a vulnerability. Maybe I should notify all the application teams that are consuming my function to let them know that a high-risk vulnerability is there and I'm going to get a fix out as soon as possible. This is the collaboration and the consumption that we're not doing as a community. And it should be get, it, we should be able to have that for every open source uh, tool on the market, right? Any open source tool right. that the Linux Foundation is managing, we should have visibility into where it's run, you know, who's consuming it. So a person who's writing Log4j could do a massive you know, uh, broadcast to say, Log4shell has an issue, here's how to fix it. And every single company using it should say, I know all the places that this version of log for shell is running. We are, we are computer scientists and we have, we have not achieved that yet. And that, you know, it's a, a passion of mine. It's like, how do we centralize the data so everybody has a central place to go to find the information, a rapid response system. Right. So in other words, this, uh, this is a great point. What, tell me if my rephrasing of that uh, makes sense. What you're saying is, uh, you create these as bombs, however it needs to be created, whether it's aggregated or or, or otherwise. The idea is that once, uh, you know, the, the S-bombs will truly serve their purpose, like a test, if you have to test the, uh, the quality of the S-bombs and the value add that they bring to the table, by, you know, when if and when you do have these vulnerabilities, how quickly can you get to the bottom of that problem? Can you tell how many applications are impacted in my organization, how many microservices, how those affected or impacted microservices actually happen to be using my library so I can actually make the fixes or adjustments necessary. Is that if, you know, exactly. is, is that the way you define the quality of, of the SBOMs? Yes. That's the way I define the quality of the security data that's being pushed across the life cycle. Because remember the SBOM has to have a, a, a connection to a runtime environment. So it's not just the SBOM, it is if it, this SBOM is connected to a binary, a, a, let's just do it in a decouple just to emphasize the complexity. This SBOM is associated to a, a, a container, let's just keep it simple. That container is associated to an application release, a version of an application. And that version of an application is running in certain environments, whether it be dev test or prod. So if you are thinking about rapid response and you know that there's a, a high risk vulnerability that's just been that's just been found, what you really want to know immediately is, are my end users impacted? Is my production environment impacted? 
That is the very first thing. If you find out, no, it's not running anywhere except in dev, you're like, thank goodness, we, don't we, we need to make sure that we fix it in dev before it goes to production. But you know your hair's not on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Because your hair may be on fire if you find out that you're you're still using an old version of log for shell that allows somebody to get into your root system and do whatever they they care to do. So this is the point, right? It's that the it's the vulnerabilities that we want to be able to address. It's S bombs give us the information of where who's consuming that particular package that has that particular vulnerability. And at the end of the day, that's what we need to be able to have that rapid response and get teams really good at being able to defend themselves when, it, when something does happen. Because no matter how hard we code no, and do code scanning, no matter how hard we set up zero trust policies, all those are really good things. Something is going to get through. It's, it's inevitable. And right now, until we can set up all of those systems, in my mind, if I'm running a production environment... I want to take, I want to know what's running where so that if I find a vulnerability, we can get it fixed as rapidly as possible. It is the response that's critical. It's not the uh, root cause analysis. And that's why I like to use chaos engineering in this, it, it, their, that practice in the, in the realm of addressing software security vulnerabilities. It's the same kind of thing. It's a team that's going to have to have the core, the basic data, just the basic information they need to know how they're, you know, to know that they're, they've got toilet paper on their shoe <laughs> and they're walking around with it. Somebody tell me if I have toilet paper on my shoe or my zippers down. And that is the essence because we don't have the data to let people know if their zippers down. You know, I have actually a lot more questions based on what you just said. I don't know if we can get to it in this podcast, but hopefully I can convince you to come to the next one. Because, you know, one of my one of the questions, at least I'll throw that out. You don't have to answer this right now because we've gotten to the probably the uh, tail end of this first session, at least, which is, you know, there's two parts to <clears throat> reacting to these vulnerabilities, at least the way I see it. One is, okay, knowing what uh, is in the bill of materials, software bill of materials, and how many apps I have, how many microservices, Yada, yada, yada. And I, I find out, okay, these are the six applications that are using this particular library and there's a problem. Somebody's need got, uh, uh, somebody's going to have to go and fix it. How quickly you can get to that point also speaks volumes about the quality of the bill of materials and the process that you have up until that place. But that, as I see, Tracy, and correct me if I'm wrong, is just one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, and I'm looking at it as, as one of the things I do as, as an architect, which is, when you make a selection choice of libraries, that's that's a different topic altogether. You know, finding an open source library that's well supported, you know, it, it's it's actually been adopted by a lot of people. It, it has plenty of open PRs. Uh, you know, there's a lot of activity and and so on and so forth. But I, if somebody told me, Chris, there is an application that has this library that's being used, there is a vulnerability, go fix it. It's it's one part of it is to go find out where the problem is, but how you fix the problem is an entirely different issue. It's so true. It is. <laughs> it is, and we don't have good centralized data about that. Somebody's figured it out, right? So the, maybe the, the so, so, somebody knows. Somebody knows how to fix it. And the problem is everybody has to figure out how to fix it. So it, that we don't have, like, there should be a, some kind of, you know, let's think about FEMA just for a minute. If we have a, a emergency, um, FEMA has it down how to respond to that emergency. Why can't we have a FEMA system for open source vulnerabilities? Where we have a central place to go to say, there's the vulnerability, here's how to fix it. Now, if that was the case, what we could do is start bringing that information in and doing it automatically. We don't need to have a human say, we need to bring this new library in and, and rebuild our, our image and push it back out to production. Eventually, we should be able to do that in an automated way. Why not? But you know, I, mean, I hear what you're saying, Tracy. But it's it's interesting, but it's also very complicated. At least the way I see it, right? I, you know, one of the things I do at Snowpal is, is architecting our solutions and applications. Now we make, you know, we go through a reasonably due uh, process of due diligence before we pick and choose an open source library that we want to be able to use. But we. You know, but but to go to the next level of saying, hey, if any of these n number of libraries that we actually use ends up having a vulnerability that we have to address, how do you plan for it up front? In other words, 
even if you're using the exact same library across three different microservices in your organization or across different organizations, the type of impact, both the magnitude of impact that it, it could and it possibly is going to have on your services and the way you're going to have to approach the fixing of it. Can I replace and substitute that library with something else? That would be the easiest thing to do, but it's, it's easier well, said than done. Well, that generally is right? the update. That is generally what happens. You, you get a, the, 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 con, the producer provides the fix and then the consumer updates their package with that new version to get it out. That's generally the fix. We don't necessarily have something, you know, a, a vulnerability in the software world that's as easy as updating a configuration parameter, like in the Nginx example. We generally have to rebuild and resend in order to get it fixed. That but, but, is But Tracy, you mentioned the, the, but it, it, that, that's assuming that the producer is going to actively work on these vulnerabilities, which may or may not be true with these open source libraries. I mean... Is that fair so to you say? have to fix it yourself, right? If there, this is why I was saying earlier, it might, it's an interesting. If we had more data and if we were collecting more data about open source, we could look to see. We could go to the repo for that open source and see there was maybe two or maybe one or two developers actually doing work on it, and know it is a, it's a high risk, and maybe we don't want to consume it. Right. Maybe at least we should be flagged that it ha that that. that you, there is a risk associated to that that's beyond just a vulnerability. The risk is its maintenance. Correct. Yeah. You so, know, but we can't. But as long as we're not gathering this information, we don't have a central intelligence system that built. We don't have a FEMA for open source. That that data is not easily uh, available. And you know, who who knew that Log4j was being managed by one person who supported it for years for all these companies? <clears throat> he should have been a millionaire, right, <laughs> or a bazillionaire, <laughs> but he wasn't. He's just a guy who gave a who wrote a nice logging routine and didn't really, you know, what what wasn't. I think he was accountable, but how accountable can you be? If right. No, it, and this is the same problem right now. That it, this is a whole different topic, but it goes along the same line. Um, Jenkins. Jenkins is an amazing, amazing tool. Um, and we've all relied on it as a CI server for many, many years. But we don't have a lot of end users putting money back into Jenkins. They're just right. using it. They're not, they're not supporting the, you know, they're not signing up at the CD Foundation as, um, as end users and, you know, giving the CD Foundation some money to support Jenkins. They are relying on the open source community to give it for give it give software open source software for free. The thing is, open source software isn't free. It's free to use, but it's not free to create. And we find ourselves in a position where we now have a lot, and that's a terrible word. We have a massive amount of reliance on open source software, which is why the Linux Foundation has made such a uh, has started really trying to solve the problem of how you secure open source software. But when it comes to the pa the smaller packages that people bring in and you have a, you know some really good programmers who've developed these great little packages, how accountable are they to continually monitor them and maintain them for you? I don't think right. that we can expect it, right? This is why understanding the big picture of the packages that we bring in is so critical. It goes beyond just provenance. It goes beyond, oh, yes, it was created by this, by this company. Google created it. Because we're not going to just consume the, the, the uh, packages that maybe Google or IBM created. We're going to consume the packages that we want. <laughs> right. And it's hard to control that. It's really, really, it, now that the cat's out of the bag, in fact, we have lots of cats out of the bag, it's really hard to herd them back into the bag. And in a, in a lot of ways, I think some of these um, practices that we're trying to do is trying to herd cats back into the bag. And I just don't think it is practical in the long run, and it's not sustainable. You know, uh, as we get to the end of this first podcast, I want to say one thing. And, uh, I, you know, on your page, on your website, so folks, if you go to deployhub.com, uh, there's there's a, a diagram that you know perhaps in the next subsequent podcast uh, we can you know uh, talk a bit more about it. The, there are eight items there. Uh, it is titled "Fragmented Supply Chain Security and DevOps Metadata Collected from the DevOps Pipeline." 
I'm just going to read out those eight boxes, the names, and then we don't have to discuss them right now. I'm just going to read out just in the interest of, you know, completeness and for folks who want to dig deeper into it. One is open source usage and inventory. Again, this is on deployhub.com. Vulnerability blast radius, organizational risk scorecards, runtime environment audits, SBOM sharing and aggregation, historical versions and trends, threat modeling, configuration metadata. I think we discussed some of these items, at least to, to some extent, certainly not all of them. Uh, before we end this podcast, Tracy, can you tell uh, the folks watching and listening a little bit about you know, Deploy Hub and the value that your product brings to the table in the context of the conversation we've had thus far? Absolutely. So uh, Deploy Hub is a uh, DevSecOps evidence store. We watch and monitor the, the pipeline. We pull any evidence that it's generating up into that evidence store so that if a vulnerability does occur, a team can rapidly respond to it. So that a CISO office can look at a production environment and see what open source uh, consumption is going on. What is the inventory of my software supply chain? So we can start thinking about threat modeling and trend analysis. Trends are so important to companies. So Deploy Hub is all about uh, bringing some confidence into the use and, and consumption of open source and allowing for rapid response when a vulnerability does occur. And we connect the, S, the we connect the S bomb. Let's just put it that way: the S bomb and the vulnerabilities to the production environment. So when a vulnerability does show up, we can give you the blast radius of that vulnerability. So really, really what we, you know, overall at the end of the day, what we're really shooting for is the ability for teams to understand what they're running in production environments, all the way down to those gory low level open source package details. Wonderful. Uh, folks, I'm going to include the link to uh, Tracy's uh, product uh, in the podcast and also Tracy's LinkedIn profile, just so you have a way to uh, connect and contact. Uh, again, uh, We've had this wonderful conversation about software supply chain and configuration management. I know we've just scratched the surface, but I've had my share of learning in the last 15 minutes, thanks to Tracy, who's the CEO and co-founder of Deploy Hub. Uh, with that, Tracy, uh, you know, if you have any closing comments, you could say that, and then we can end this first podcast. Not really. It's been a, Chris, your questions have been spot on. And I hope that the folks that are listening um, start thinking about this problem beyond monolithic applications, because this problem really does, it's, it grows every time you create a, a new container that's being consumed by multiple applications. <laughs> right. The dependency map just grows and grows and grows. And I like to call it a Death Star. So I want you to think about how do you manage your Death Star? That, with that, I think we'll end this podcast. Thank you so much, Tracy. Talk to you soon. So welcome.